Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today, actually, just kind of a quick note. You, lovely, beautiful bastards, and I mean this in the nicest way, can stop hounding and pestering me because, yes, in the very near future, at a date that I'm about to decide, we'll finally be releasing the Don't Be Stupid, Stupid Mask. When those go live, of course, I will announce it here, but if you wanna be the first to know and first to grab, you can, of course, text me at 8 one three two one three four four two three perfect great love your faces then in wow breaking news it, it turns out rich people have a different set of rules wow i know this is probably shocking to you no Obviously not. Most of you also live in the real world. But specifically, what I'm talking about today involves a college admissions scandal. Actually, more specifically, it is about a new report that has come out following the original scandal of Varsity Blues last year. This report detailing how between 2013 and 2018, four University of California campuses admitted dozens of less qualified but well-connected students. Those four being Berkeley, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, and San Diego. And among the 64 applicants who were flagged by state auditor Elaine Howell, the majority were white and at least half came from families with average annual incomes of 150 thousand dollars or more. And while that by itself is not shocking, the details of how and why some of these students were admitted is pretty outrageous. For example, in one instance, a child of a major donor applied to UC Berkeley but received the lowest possible score on their application, which was marked do not recommend. However, a donor relations admin later revived that application and passed it along to an unnamed coach, noting that the family had a huge capacity to donate and was already a big supporter of Cal. According to the audit, that coach then backed up that applicant as a prospective student athlete, despite the fact that this applicant, quote, had played only a single year of the sport in high school and at a low level of competition. That student then accepts a spot at Berkeley and their family donates several thousand dollars to the team. But as the report notes, the applicant never competed with the team and the coaches removed the applicant from the team after the season ended. In a different example laid out in the audit, you had a UCLA coach admit a student as an athlete as a favor to a donor. This even though the student's application had already been marked denied. In fact, 22 of the 64 applicants were admitted with the endorsement of athletic departments despite not meeting the athletic qualifications. Also, in another example, you had an applicant who based babysat for the colleague of the former admissions director being accepted, despite being much less qualified than other applicants. Now, alongside that report, in a letter to Governor Gavin Newsom in the California State Legislature, we saw Howell saying, we conclude that the university has allowed for improper influence in admissions decisions and it has not treated applicants fairly or consistently. By admitting 64 non-competitive applicants, the university undermined the fairness and integrity of its admissions process and deprived more qualified students of the opportunity for admission. With Howell then recommending that the UC Office of the President oversee admissions for at least three years to quote ensure that the campus provides a merit-based admissions process that is free of improper influence, especially at UC Berkeley, which dominated this report with 42 of the total cases. But one of the big things here is that Hal believes that this could go much, much deeper. Telling NBC News, there's at least another 400 or so students that were really questionable. Now, from there, we saw UC President Michael Drake responding, saying that Hal's audit follows two internal audits that identified many of the same issues. Drake saying that Hal's audit will be used to improve the admissions system. Also, seemingly taking the blame away from their system and more on individuals, stressing that the individuals involved in improper activities will be disciplined appropriately, with a spokesperson for UCLA saying that its athletics-related incidents happened before the school adopted additional safeguards. At UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara talking about recent reforms. But ultimately, that is where we are with the story. And once again, this is of course separate from last year's college admission scandal. Right, Operation Varsity Blues, that scandal leading to the convictions of people like Felicity Huffman and Lori Loughlin. And really between that and this, it, it makes you wonder how rampant is is this. I think there is this general understanding of rich people have different rules. And when you look to the instances with Lachlan and Huffman, you also maybe start to think, were they just kind of scapegoats? A way to make it appear that something was getting done, when in fact the broad system is built against those that don't have greater means. That you can bust your ass and through grants and loans or whatever means you can pay tuition, and somehow that's still not enough. Some fucking rich kid who doesn't meet the qualifications and standards still gonna get in because mommy and daddy have deeper pockets. And also, part of the reason I wonder how rampant this is across the country, to actually go back to Drake's point that there were internal audits. It's important to note that an internal audit of the nine UC schools released earlier this year, back in February, that one only found two instances of possible impropriety. But then, with the state, we see a lot more pop up. Which I mean, even just that by itself, that raises red flags and questions. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love 
of today and today in awesome brought to you by manscaped.com. If you didn't know, Manscaped is the premium brand for men's grooming and hygiene. They've got a ton of great grooming and lifestyle products, but they have really changed the game with their new Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trim, which is great because honestly, there are very few things worse than ear and nose maintenance gone wrong. If it has happened to you, you know what I'm talking about. The Manscaped team spent over a year reinventing the nose hair trimmer with a focus on performance and comfort. It comes from the same proprietary skin safe technology as their lawnmower body trimmer, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs. It's also water resistant and features a powerful 9,000 RPM motor with a 360 degree rotary dual blade system. And right now, Manscaped has their new performance package, which includes all the tools you need for below the waist grooming and hygiene, plus their new Weed Whacker nose and ear trimmer. Also, make sure to select the Peak Hygiene Plan at checkout to receive a replaceable blade every three months delivered straight to your door for ultra convenience. But yeah, just head on over to manscaped.com slash fail to get 20% off and free shipping today. And the first bit of awesome today is we had time releasing their 100 most influential people of 2020, splitting their picks across pioneers, artists, leaders, titans, icons, and their picks including a broad spectrum. The likes of Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Dr. Fauci, Jair Bolsonaro, all the way to Megan Thee Stallion, Jojo Siwa, Michael B. Jordan. Also, something I find very interesting that we've actually seen time do in the past, they had other notable figures writing short pieces for each person on that list. For example, Michael B. Jordan's that was written by Denzel Washington, Jojo Siwa's done by Kim Kardashian West, Patrick Mahomes done by Derek Jeter. And going through the 100, there, there's a lot of interesting reads. And of course, I think to remember with this list is that it's not about if you like them or not, it is about influence. Yeah, I definitely recommend checking it out, even to just find out about people that you didn't know of before. Then in other awesome, we got a trailer for The Cabin with Burt Kreischer, as well as a trailer for David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet. We had a relationship therapist reviewing Guardian of the Galaxy relationships. We had Donkey taking on Super Mario Galaxy, which I will say, Super Mario 3D All-Stars is by far one of my favorite recent purchases. Getting to re-experience this stuff with my son, it's it's awesome. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about the huge news and update regarding the death of Brianna Taylor. Brianna Taylor, of course, was a 26-year-old EMT in Louisville, Kentucky, who was shot and killed in her own apartment by police in what has been described as a botched drug raid. Police had a warrant because they believed that an ex-boyfriend of Brianna's was using her apartment to receive packages. Notably, Taylor nor her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, had any prior drug arrests or convictions. No drugs were found in the apartment. You had police claiming that they knocked several times and they announced themselves as they broke down the door, but that police account has been heavily disputed by Taylor's family, Walker, and multiple neighbors, all claiming the police did not say who they were or that they were serving a warrant, which is a key factor there because you had Walker saying he didn't know who it was, thinking it was her ex or intruders breaking into the house. He fires a weapon, hitting one of the officers in the leg. They respond by unloading, with reportedly one of the officers, Detective Brett Hankison, blindly firing 10 shots in the apartment. Rihanna Taylor was struck multiple times by the officers and died. And since this happened, there has been so much outrage. There's been a call from a huge chunk of the country calling for the arrests of the officers who killed Brianna Taylor. And we've been waiting to see what was going to happen next. You know, the last time we talked about this story, we saw the wrongful death lawsuit settled with the city paying a record-breaking $12 million. But for pretty much everyone involved, including Brianna Taylor's mother, it wasn't over. There was the big question of what is going to happen to the officers that did this. And today we got that update with the breaking news that none of the three officers involved in the death of Brianna Taylor will face charges related to the actual death, right? No homicide charges, not even manslaughter charges. Two of the officers weren't even charged at all, that being Jonathan Mattingly and Miles Cosgrove. But we did end up seeing Brett Hankison being charged with three counts of wanton endangerment. And that reportedly not connected to the death of Brianna Taylor, but rather because he ended up shooting into neighboring apartments. And those charges, right, wanton endangerment are a class D felony, meaning Hankison could be facing between one and five years in prison for each count. And along with this news, we heard from Daniel Cameron, the Kentucky AG, regarding the warrant itself and whether police knocked and announced themselves, he said. Evidence shows that officers both knocked and announced their presence at the apartment. The officer's statements about their announcement are corroborated by an independent witness who was near in a proximity to apartment four. In other words, the warrant was not served as a no-knock warrant. Then going on to say that after the officers got no response, the decision was made to enter. Then going on to say that Officer Mattingly was the first and only officer to enter. Going on to say that Mattingly saw Walker and Taylor. Walker shot Mattingly. Mattingly responds by firing six times. Going on to say that Officer Cosgrove, who was also in the doorframe, then fired 16 times. And regarding Hankison, the Kentucky AG said, Detective Hankinson fired his weapon 10 times, including from a outside sliding glass door and through a bedroom window. Some bullets traveled through apartment four and into apartment three before some exited 
that apartment. At the time, three residents of apartment three were at home, including a male, a pregnant female, and a child. Cameron going on to say that Breonna Taylor was shot six times, though uh, I do want to note here that number does appear to be new because her death certificate says that she was shot five times. Either way though, Cameron then goes on to say that only one of the shots was fatal. And regarding that shot, he said, The FBI ballistics analysis concluded the fatal shot was fired by Detective Cosgrove. Cameron also adding, I think it is worth repeating again that our investigation found that Mattingly and Cosgrove were justified in their use of force after having been fired upon by Kenneth Walker. And regarding the, the charges, the lack of charges, everything with this situation, we saw Daniel Cameron saying, I know that not everyone will be satisfied with the charges we've reported today. My team set out to investigate the circumstances surrounding Ms. Taylor's death. We did it with a singular goal in mind, pursuing the truth. Kentuckians deserve no less. The city of Louisville deserves no less. Every person has an idea of what they think justice is. My role as special prosecutor in this case is to set aside everything in pursuit of the truth. My job is to present the facts to the grand jury, and the grand jury then applies those facts to the law. If we simply act on emotion or outrage, there is no justice. Mob justice is not justice. Justice sought by violence is not justice. It just becomes revenge. And of course, with this news breaking, there's been a lot of big reaction. But ultimately, as we're filming this video, there is a question of what kind of fallout are we gonna see from this, right? I mean, this news coming on the heels of Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher declaring a state of emergency yesterday, issuing a 9 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. curfew due to the potential for civil unrest ahead of the announcement today. Actually, was also reporting the Louisville Metro Police Department saying it would physically restrict access to the downtown area ahead of the jury's announcement. The National Guard has also been deployed to Louisville. And so for now, we'll have to wait and see what happens next. But uh, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts with this news? What do you think of the charges that we're seeing? And I guess maybe more notably, the charges that we are not seeing. Any and all thoughts you have on this, why you have them, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives in the news, supporting the show with a like or however you do it. Also, if you're new here, definitely hit that subscribe button and maybe text me at 813-213-4423 for notifications on new videos, behind the scenes, other stuff. But with that said, of course, as always, my name Philip DeFranco, you've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.